Welcome guys to Pax Arubiana, this time from Vienna International District. Yeah. I will talk now about UN reform, the United Nations reform and about uh, several other issues I think will be of concern. But let me start first of all with welcoming you to the Vienna International District. This is one of the United Nations headquarters here and this is basically the heart of the International District of Vienna. Here you see many big buildings. Uh, it's uh, like um, in France or in Paris, they have this La Défense. This is the new town uh, on the other side of the Danube. Over there is the Danube. Here is this beautiful UN center. And let me start with a call here exactly that Kosovo should be member of the United Nations. That's the first thing. And the second thing I would like to explain is that no, if we join NATO as Austria, then it doesn't have to mean that the UN has to leave because to my best knowledge, the headquarter of the United Nations is in New York. That's the anchor power of the world. That's the United States uh, city, absolutely. So I think they won't have uh, to relocate. Uh, the US is in the NATO and in the UN and has the headquarter. So all these rumors that when I'm right and we join uh, NATO and, the, and then uh, the UN would relocate because of the Switzerland president is completely unfounded. So first of all, Kosovo as a full member and also don't be afraid, Vienna can still be and will for the future undetermined be one of the capitals of the United Nations. We have a lot of these institutions here like the International Atomic Energy, UNIDO and there are others and uh, you can see online. Yeah? But this is basically the headquarter and I will now explain because it's the 14th of August it's the day when the Western world was born, in a sense. Because why? It is the day of the signing of the Atlantic Charter. In the Atlantic, basically, the leader, the president of um, the United States and of the United Kingdom, the two main allies to be, and they were basically signing this document, the Atlantic Charter. And all the post-war world order, all the institutions we have today, which govern the world, like the UN, but also all the others, which had to be then additionally created, or sector organizations like the World Health Organization, the World Trade Organization, but also the European ones for security, especially NATO and the OECD and the OECD, are basically uh, the logical outspring of the Atlantic Charter. So if you look for a birthday, for the UN and for the Western World Order, it is uh, the 14th of August 1941, where under the hammering blows of Nazi Germany and the challenge of um, the Soviet Union, a clear fundament of the Western World Order uh, was created and laid uh, down by the two main um, powers of the Western World, United States and United Kingdom. So good. That's still today the case. Yeah? They still are veto powers and the United States is the anchor power of the West. But obviously some things have changed. We are now 70 um, years. It's now exactly, it's, uh, exactly, it's interesting, it's 41. So basically this is the birthday. It's exactly 80 years ago. <laughs> I'm very accurate. 80 years ago exactly. Yeah? I couldn't have better found a better location, a better place for this video. 80 years ago, obviously the world has changed. Yeah? In 44-45, the UN was created in the San Francisco conferences and all the attached meetings afterwards. And then obviously the world changed already in 47 because the Soviet Union basically declared the Cold War by taking over Eastern Europe everywhere where a tank of the Soviets was standing. They didn't want to leave anymore and they didn't want to have a free world or something like this. They wanted to impose Soviet communism. And so basically the Cold War started. So from the beginning, the whole mechanism which the UN was designed for, to have five veto powers who are working for the principles of the UN, was in the year 47 in a way already obsolete, but certainly obsolete under the hammer blows of the Korean attack uh, where the Soviet Union uh, was uh, taking over uh, South Korea for almost, yeah, and then had to be repelled and there was an armistice later and the division again as a role model 
also for the it's still divided Korea. And obviously, you know, the Soviet Union was banned for war and for conquest. And also the Soviet Union basically helped, oh, yeah, the Chinese don't see it that way now today, but basically in 47 to 49, uh, the Soviet um, Union helped uh, the communist China to take over power. And so they conquered the second seat of the UN. The first one was given to them because they were the ally. And the idea was they were good and they will be behaving. And the second one uh, they conquered basically with the takeover of China because it was originally the seat of uh, the free Chinese, obviously. But by conquering China, they inherited that seat. It took until 71 uh, that they could get it when there was this kind of realignment when basically under the hammer blows of the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia and then uh, the uh, killing of the uh, Prague Spring and then obviously the Kissinger and everybody tried to get uh, the very angry Chinese they were really very angry about what happened uh, against the Czechoslovakian Republic and uh, then uh, basically this led to the Sino-Soviet split until to war they, they actually had a war in uh, 69 And then uh, the uh, Americans understood it's possible to break them gradually away. And one of the carrots was to really get the seat back here. And so since 71, uh, there is uh, two seats uh, for uh, the anti-Western camp. Yeah? And obviously, you know, there was divisions in them. But uh, to this day, we have a situation where Russia, which is bent for revanchism now under Putin 20 years, and communist China and they are blocking that organization and it cannot work appropriately according to its founding values as whatever the Western principles, the Atlantic Charter values, freedom, individual rights, human rights and all these things. It is absolutely blockaded by the fact that these two organized uh, countries which have different directions in their philosophy, in their authoritarianism, in their anti-democratic uh, systems, they are blocking that organization. So the Western world, the same countries, uh, the US and the EU had to create different organizations and so the whole plethora of organizations, NATO, EU and OSD and uh, OSD was created in order to somehow remedy the fact that the Soviets never really wanted that uh, one, but had the power to block it. And uh, the Chinese from 71 on were some kind of very luckluster <laughs> participants in, and obviously to this day, a communist anti-democratic system. And uh, that's a big problem for that organization. So it needs to be reformed. That's what I promised uh, to explain you. Enough about history. What is my specific proposal from Pax Europeana to reform the UN? And here I'm again absolutely agreeing with the Security Council, but not with uh, five permanent members, ten uh, uh, non-permanent members, and all these kind of uh, issues attached to it. No, the better way is uh, to have uh, ten uh, permanent members. I will explain exactly who should be the ten permanent members in my small video. Just a little bit of a turn to entertain you where I am in the Vienna uh, district and to the pension must be there. Who are the ten permanent members? Look, obviously there should be Russia still in. Yeah, It's a big power, it has nuclear arms and it is of course, it has the thinking of a big power. Economically it's no longer. But it has this approach, so it makes sense for Russia to be continuing. Obviously, I think um, it should be suspended, uh, but with a seat in the Security Council because of the Crimean invasion and the Donbass war and because it's actively fighting against everything the UN stands for. <laughs> so obviously it should be suspended, but it should have in theory a seat. Yeah? The same for the Chinese. Yeah? The Chinese have not broken any Uh, of the rules. They have not invaded anybody, so they should uh, be continuing to be a member. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but it is the reality. I agree with that. So that's two. Yeah? So we have two. America, obviously free. And then obviously I'm in favor of the French seat to be transformed in the European Union seat. And that's a very logical uh, situation. So it's four seats. The Fran France is no longer uh, in what kind of right it got it from the beginning. It was historically, it was a defeated nation in 1944, but there was this, and we, by giving and treating France like a big power, it led to many problems in Vietnam and, you know, they were behaving like a big power without the resources 
breaking down several times and it was a complete mess. So France seat must be transferred in the European Union seat. If we in the EU are not doing that, we are not serious. Because we have common security policy, so that's logical. So that's the fourth seat. The fifth seat is the question of the United Kingdom. There is no reason why a country like the United Kingdom should have such power. So the logic is that it shares this power with the Commonwealth Secretariat. Yeah? That's of course a bit of a more stretch, I understand that. Yeah? But where is the logic that the United Kingdom with 67 million people has a seat on the Security Council? It's not uh, backed up by the military or economic power. It has institutional soft power, that's true. They are very capable diplomats. But nevertheless, as you see now with Afghanistan, the time of power projection of the United Kingdom for the good in the world, whenever it was or not, uh, you can debate, it is no longer there. So also that must be transferred to the, United, uh, to the Commonwealth of Nations. It has also, the Commonwealth then has to be reformed. But that's the logic I think is very important. So you see also the direction where I'm coming. That's basically five of them. Then obviously the big um, union state or state federation in the world which is missing is India. India must be in the United Nations. The only, also in the Security Council, the only reason why it isn't was at the beginning it was still part of the United Kingdom and then later in 47 when it got independent India and uh, later broke in parts and then it was obviously the case that the UN was already created and there was no willingness uh, to uh, allow that uh, basically to happen so uh, that is absolutely long overdue so we are at six and then come the other federations which are important I start in the West the organization of American states. It should be also reformed, integrated, but there is no sense to give it to Brazil directly. What would the other countries say? So the OAS is obviously uh, number seven, and then three more to go in the logic uh, towards then the African Union. It's number eight, yeah? and then it's uh, the organization of Islamic states, OIC, and then it's uh, the ASEAN countries uh, in Uh, the East uh, together, obviously ASEAN must then include also the other countries of the region and that means uh, South Korea and Japan to join ASEAN together with some other of the missing uh, smaller pits, uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, Bangladesh uh, and um, there is also one more I forgot now. But you know that is basically the 10, um, the 10 uh, states, states federation, I think this is only for very big states. Like uh, I made already the case, America is also a federation of states. It's a state union, a union state. Yeah, You know, it's a state now, obviously, after the concept, but it's very powerful. So is obviously China. It's also a very big continental union. So is India. So is also the Russian Federation, while it should be suspended for the moment until it is a peaceful uh, federation again and has uh, given back uh, Crimea and also Uh, then uh, removed its troops from Donbass. Yeah. So basically, but I repeat myself a bit, you know, America, United States of America and the Organization of American States, two for the Americas. And then obviously in Europe, um, it's a bit overlapping with the Commonwealth, the European Union and the African Union and the Organization of Islamic States. That's the organization, by the way, it's uh, the seat is in Cheddar. Look it up. Oh, I see. It's not the Olympic Committee. I know what I'm saying. It's the Organization of Islamic States. Yeah, uh, Oh, I see. Yeah? It's very important to discuss that later on. But, and then obviously China and the ASEAN countries. I know some people say, Günther, that's unrealistic. It's better we have Germany in and Japan, uh, the aggressors from the past, and they are now peaceful. And so we have um, the better settlement. But why? We have the European Union now. France and Germany are no longer the classical nation states. They have contributed and pooled and ceded their authority to the European level. So how then parallel to be on the global level directly only what me as an Austrian, I'm represented by the French vote, I'm represented by the, uh, by the German vote. No, but I'm represented by uh, Mr. Borrell and Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen and Mr. Michel. With Mr. Michel, I'm not so happy, but nevertheless, yeah. So that's the idea. 
And so the same is also true for ASEAN, for the African Union, and also for the American states and also for the Organization of Islamic States and also for the Commonwealth of Nations. Obviously, you can say then we have some double representation because India is in the Commonwealth and India is as well, uh, of course, directly represented. Yes, okay, good, but that's not a big problem. That will mean there will be more coordination necessary and there will be uh, some kind of um, double legitimacy. It's not a big problem. You know, it's not a big problem when you are in the Commonwealth of Nations and in the EU, as maybe, I don't know, Malta or, or others, uh, or when you are an um, Islamic country in the Islamic uh, Global Cooperation, or I see, and you are also in the African Union, I don't see it as a big problem. Yeah, I see, of course, that this regional integration system will have to be strengthened. Their mechanisms have to be stronger, especially this is true for the African and for the American um, uh, states, OIS, and also for the ASEAN states, which then have to include Japan. And that's also complicated with all the crimes which Japan has uh, committed. But Japan, you know, they want even to have a Security Council seat. <laughs> so they should be ready then to share power uh, with their friends in ASEAN, in Southeastern A Asian Organization. And they have to find the mechanism uh, to, um, to co uh, integrate themselves into that organization peacefully and in coordination. So here, of course, then, for example, people from medium states uh, like uh, Turkey, Brazil, Japan, Germany, they will say, oh, that's very unfair. <laughs> we have then to always talk with the Austrians, in the case of the Germans and with the Swedes, <laughs> about our position. Why don't we send the tanks? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's uh, not the time. Uh, and uh, that was not very successful. So ultimately, Germany is part of the European Union. France is part of the European Union. When we are serious, we do it like this. If it's only some kind of uh, entertainment, <laughs> Uh, and it's just valid for Europe and not for the global stage, then we make any hard mistake and we should change our direction. So then the same is also true for the United Kingdom. I talked about it. Japan, yes. Of course, the most problematic organization is the Organization of Islamic States. Yeah? We have many, many issues uh, with Iran, with Afghanistan, with Syria, with Iraq and uh, Sudan and there are many many complicated issues yeah but we have to address them <laughs> it's better to be represented <laughs> it's better to be represented and it's the best possible way and of course you know the UN won't be easier with then 10 permanent members but the legitimacy of the UN's decision will be much higher <laughs> because the whole world will be much better represented and obviously we can then avoid and we should avoid because one of the problems of this organization I will discuss in a second video is that it's very much based on um, sovereign states only. <laughs> and here that might be a very good idea in 45, and, but we had about 60 members, uh, 50 members I think at the founding and it's now close to 200. And many of them are very problematic and there is a big problem in the UN that needs also to be reformed that countries like Syria are fully legitimate countries whenever they have committed genocide and killed many people, destroyed uh, the livelihood of millions, forced many into refugee, but then they are like sitting in the UN committees. <laughs> I mean, there's something wrong, <laughs> obvious. And now the Taliban will conquer Afghanistan, and the UN will do nothing, and then uh, the Taliban will be sitting in a legitimate UN government and send and vote and contribute to world governance. <laughs> I mean, there's something wrong. And it's not that I'm against the UN. Don't get me wrong. I'm not from that ideological direction and that I'm against world governments. I'm very much in favor of world governance. I'm very much of a strong UN, good global governance. I'm for a better funded UN. I think that we should uh, contribute up to 0.5 of global GDP on the UN system overall, not only the UN, but all the global governance systems are under the UN should get um, significantly more money and should be working much better. But also the governance of them. <laughs> we cannot have Syria, Afghanistan and Sudan voting. <laughs> you know, when they are genocidal terror regimes and they break down fragile states and they don't pay their membership fee, freeze their <laughs> voting rights. 
Absolutely. And we have to reform the decision-making process to have the whole world more legitimately represented and not uh, to just play for the Japanese or for the Germans or for the French or for the British. No, the way I described it in these 10 seats, it's the whole world permanently inside. And it helps very much because it strengthens regional governments, organizations like the EU, like ASEAN, like African Union, and like uh, the Islamic uh, states, because that's really then also they will have the power to veto something. They will have the power to permanently speak in the round table in the UN. And that's very meaningful. And that's very important. And that will also give something like more regional responsibility to solving regional issues regionally. <laughs> Because not everything can be solved by the UN, but many more things could, I think. So, yes, I think that's the most important things I wanted to say about the changes the UN should do. Uh, the necessary reorganization of the Security Council, Kosovo to be inside, also, by the way, Palestina. And uh, so we will be close to 200 states. Yeah? Also, Bougainville will come, so we have reached the 200. It's historic because we started, I think, in 44, 45 with about 60 states. Yeah? And then obviously it became more and more with the fall of the empires. And that's also very good. So I'm in favor for an organization like the UN and the UN itself. Yeah? But it must be structurally reformed. Fragile states, genocidal states cannot vote. Like uh, there was always this Libya on the UN Human Rights Council debate. And so that's, of course, undermining huh? the legitimacy. And it's not possible that we have only these five countries from the past uh, to be governing everything. It must be ten. And it is, in my view, after I have, now, I have written my first article about this for the, in an essay competition for the Council of Foreign Affairs of the US, I think 25 years ago. <laughs> Obviously, I understand it is not going to happen because Russia and China don't want it and uh, the British don't want it and the French because the five are very happy with the system. <laughs> they don't want any change. Mm. But uh, the change must come uh, where it starts ultimately is in an alliance between the European Union to wrangle down the French for the seat and with India because that's the two biggest injustices that uh, I'm as an Austrian are not represented and that we have 450 million of Europeans which are represented only by the French president and he does what he wants. That's entirely unfair and that must change and there is also this progress. I think that's uh, absolutely logical. And then India as well because that's uh, about uh, soon as much people as in China. I think in five years they will have more and then they are not on the table at the United Nations. It's utterly unfair. Huh? And obviously because Russia is breaking all the rules and attacking country by country and these are the three main drivers of change. And, but in general it's also that the African Union is much more integrated, much more successful now and also, uh, this, uh, and also ASEAN has developed and the question of representation of Japan is also a burning issue. And so also the whole issues and the burning conflicts in the Islamic world which is now so open, escalating in the case of Afghanistan again, requires also to have a, a different uh, integration level and visibility level of the Islamic world uh, on the global governance level. And uh, they are obviously the most underrepresented together with the Africans and with the Asians. And when you look at it, you know, it's basically just one non-European power. If you want to include uh, Russians in the wider term European and you have only China <laughs> four against one in my system of this 10 um, permanent you have of course uh, the OIS huh? you can include them in the wider context of European but you have definitely the Commonwealth that's most of the people are from uh, non-European countries today and then you have also the African Union the organization of Islamic States and uh, then you have uh, India, and then you have China, and then you have also uh, the Asian countries, uh, Southeast Asian countries, ASEAN. So it's uh, already one, two, three in Asia. It's uh, in the Middle East, if you want, four. Africa, five. Five uh, non-Europeans. Uh, towards five 
in the broader context Europeans, the Americans, uh, the United States of America, Commonwealth if you want as well, and then uh, uh, the European Union and Russia. Yeah, if you and if you count Commonwealth as mixed yeah, between European non-Europeans, it's already only four, and uh, Russians you can count wherever. So basically, it's a very different world order in a sense. Uh, not different. It's still based on the Atlantic Charter. It's still the same UN. <laughs> But it has changed, obviously, because the Americans and the United States and uh, the European Union will have only two free votes if you count the American as a European vote in some aspect. You can do that. And so it's a very much a different power shift. And it's also reflecting the reality that the free world has gone much better, much bigger, much more inclusive. And it should be reflected as well in the UN Security Council as the most important a body for war and peace in the world. So I think I get very clear here what is and why it has to happen. And I think that system is uh, really very logical. I made thousands of tweets about it. Yeah. Nobody reads them. <laughs> Maybe this video will be easier to understand and easier also to follow my logic. And I think it's very clear uh, what needs to be happen. And the drive of change where the positive people are really in the driving seat is the um, seating of the French seat towards uh, Michel yeah, and uh, towards the European Union. I think it's the most logical start and that can be voluntarily done by the French president after the elections uh, and that's the first thing he should do uh, to transfer the seat of uh, the French uh, towards the European Union and then it will lead to um, a debate about all these things and the Chinese will not lose a lot but you know we should also show if the Chinese uh, and the Russians block this they block then Africa <laughs> it's us including the Africans it's us including ASEAN yeah? it's us offering solutions then uh, to have everybody included in world governance on the top level table via their regional representatives yeah the Islamic world the Indians and uh, the Southeast Asians yeah and the Africans and uh, the Americans and the Commonwealth, some of them even then double represented. That's a very logical system. It's much fairer, much more openness, it's better for the UN and it's the way to do it. So that's my call for the UN, more funding changes of the, um, of the decision making structure and also to be Kosovo and Palestina included and yeah what else. I think that's my call here from this beautiful town of Vienna, the Vienna International City. And yes, okay, for the Chinese, I have one other offer. Don't forget it, yeah, for the Chinese, one more. I have this proposal. When the Chinese agree, we make one headquarter like here for Hong Kong, on the condition that you keep Hong Kong reasonable and don't destroy the people there, yeah, and limit their rights further. But in Hong Kong would be a perfect new capital, a kind of fourth capital, if you want to call another seat for administration for uh, um, the UN and it's maybe an incentive to treat the people of Hong Kong better and you have uh, some sky tower, you have some big buildings already there it would be a wonderful new seat and that would be one offer for also the, to buy the Chinese into compliance with the reforms and the consent obviously and uh, to uh, build a stronger alliance because I'm again you know my thinking about that we need to work closer with China, integrate it and encourage it to be better instead of pushing it further towards the Russian, which are the source of all the wars of the last uh, 10 years and 12, 13 years now from Georgia to now and which are the real revanchist challenger. Obviously, China is much richer and uh, theoretically than a stronger opponent, but in reality it is Russia, which is the big evil empire inherited 0.2 and that's obviously the real cold war we have with Russia. Good, I think I was very clear what needs to be done and how and that's my call for the reform. Thanks a lot for listening, all the best and one more video about the division of Afghanistan to come. Thanks a lot for listening, bye!